Yes, I want to. Okay. Good. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you all very much for coming to the corporate committee meeting this evening. Um, I should advise everybody that this is a public meeting which is being live streamed for public viewing and a record of the decisions will be published the day following the meeting, so that's tomorrow. Um, if I can welcome any members of the press or the public who may not be in the chamber with us but may well be watching on online. Um, and if I could remind all committee members that this is a committee meeting where they are required to attend in person. For councillors who are accessing this meeting remotely, a reminder that uh, you won't be counted as being present for the purposes of the Local Government Act, and that you may not vote on any item under consideration. Though at the discretion of the Chair, me, uh, you may contribute to the discussion and participate in a non-decision-making capacity. Um, as we stand at the moment, I can't see any councillors who have joined online, and I haven't been advised of anybody around. Uh, yeah, no, I'm not aware of any uh, councillors joining us remotely. So I don't think that's going to be an issue that troubles us this evening. Um, and can I welcome officers as well who've joined this evening? Um, and again, I don't see any officers who've joined remotely at the moment. That's correct, Chair. Yeah. yeah, okay. So we do have some apologies for absence. Um, we've had apologies from Councillor Joseph, from Councillor Potter, from Councillor Turbot Deloff, and um, apologies for lateness from Councillor Young. Um, and as I say, we've had no, no notification of anybody attending online. Um, so if we can now move on to item two, which is declarations of interest. Um, could I ask any members to declare an interest if they have one this evening? No. Um, we haven't been advised of any interests either. Um, so thank you very much. We can move on. Um, <clears throat> first thing we need to do is to approve the terms of reference um, for corporate committees since the um, we've now got some new terms of reference um, since the councils decided on some changes is that right um, yeah just for clarification just for everybody in the room and also online just for noting chair not, not for approval Oh, thank so, you. obviously, it was okay. approved at your council meeting in July. It was. Um, yeah. So, um, it's a newly formatted uh, terms of reference. And obviously, the constitution, the new constitution is now live, went live on the 4th of September. Hopefully, everybody's had a chance to look at it. Uh, and the terms of reference for this committee is situated at Appendix 3 in the constitution. Um, and looking at the previous iteration, of the terms of reference for this committee and the new version. Uh, the only new section that I wanted to bring to the committee's attention uh, for noting is the section regarding questions to the committee. Um, unfortunately, there were, that wasn't in time for this meeting, uh, but the next corporate committee meeting is on the 12th of December, uh, and I envision that will be the first corporate committee meeting where hopefully we'll get some questions from the members of the public and also your fellow councillors. And in terms of the procedure, in terms of having those questions, that will mirror the same procedure for council. So obviously questions from the public, if we get any, will be a supplementary papers pack. Um, and the questions from the councillors will be included in the published papers. Questions from the public um, have to be with me by four clear working days for the meeting date. And for councillors, it is eight clear working days and obviously has to go through a monitoring officer as well. So, uh, um, do you think it's worth reading this out just for the, just for the record, the, the, um, the new section about questions? new section? Um, it's pretty short, isn't it? Uh, so we could, and then everybody would be clear. And if anybody had any questions on it, we could take those now. If, if anybody needs to, yeah, yes, yes, sure, your um, So let's just let's just read that bit. It says questions to the committee. A member a member of the public who lives work works or studies in the borough can ask a question of the committee with one supplementary question relating to an item on the agenda. A councillor may ask a question to the committee with one supplementary 
question relating to an item on the agenda. The total amount of time for questions with notice at the committee will be no more than 15 minutes. If the chair agrees, a member of the public can ask a question at the committee without having given notice. If a question without notice is asked, the chair will explain it might not be possible to give a full answer at the meeting and that a written response will be provided. So I think that's pretty clear. And as Gareth's just explained, if we're asking questions as councillors, you want eight days notice if they're, mm -hmm. and if a member of the public, it's four days notice. Yeah. Yes. And um, Councillor Binning Lubbock, I think we've got a question about this. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, as it doesn't stipulate here in advance how much notice a councillor would need to give, obviously the um, corporate papers aren't necessarily out for much longer than that period. So if a, if, a mem if a member has a question on the papers that are coming to the committee, giving eight days notice might be quite difficult. And I assume that the, um, the, 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 the part about if the chair agrees, then a member of the council can also ask mm. a question without notice. Yeah. Is that the case? Um, I agree with you, actually. I think it's slightly problematic because I think the, I think the papers only have to be published. Five so clear, five five clear working yeah. days for so, the meeting, yeah. So we yeah. can't really be asking for yeah. eight days notice, can we? Yeah. Um, I mean, as a matter of practice, I think it's pretty obvious that if you're here and you're a councillor, you'll be able to ask questions on the agenda, won't you? Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, that yeah. seems to me a sort of a formality that uh, but it, is, it is, you know, I suppose the nature of these things that sometimes... Well, I suppose there'd be some general questions that somebody might ask about public realm, which I know is kind of part of the corporate committee. Um, and they could ask that without seeing the agenda for the December, cause the December meeting, so... Um, Obviously. The bottom line is really that if we don't have the officers here who are relevant for the for the areas concerned, um, it would be rather difficult for us to be able to provide them with full answers. And I'd hesitate to even try, attempt to do that actually. So, you know, if it's if it's a question that couldn't be answered by the relevant personnel here, then we'd offer a written answer. I think. Um, Chair's got a question. John. Could you use your microphone? Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. oh, no, go do the button on the microphone. Okay, all right. That's all right. Sorry. <laughs> oh, yes, of course, yes, of course. The white button. Uh, with the faint, with the faint. Yeah. Gotcha, yeah. thank you. Um, all I was going to say was I think that is the um, whole point of having the questions in advance where possible. It's because if officers are there, obviously the questions aren't to officers, they're to council members to councillors but you know they can liaise with officers in relation to those questions and mm. answers to them so if if it does turn out that you have people asking questions as you said if they need to if they're they've not been given advance notice of those questions then that can be in written format yeah good okay thank you anyway personally i think it's a good thing that questions are welcomed and um let's hope we get some <laughs> um so can we note that change please no, thank you very much um okay so now we move on to the minutes of the previous meeting um so um members will be asked members who were present at the previous meeting will be asked if they can agree those minutes um from the meeting held on the 7th of june um I think we had, we do have some updates, don't we, Gareth, from, from these um, minutes? Yeah, there's some for me. Um, so I don't know if you want to just go through the minutes first, Chair, to check for accuracy. Let's do that, yeah. So does anybody have any issues to raise with regard to the accuracy of the minutes, or are we happy with oh. Councillor Vignette, Lummis? Uh, just a couple small ones. On page 17, um, 9.3, the first bullet point says an organogram, obviously it should be an organogram. I'm not sure whether we've um, actually had that through or, or should that also be listed in the actions um, that we should be getting an organogram. Um, and then on the next page, at the top of the next page, page 18, it says a street populist coordinator. Um, is that a typo? I don't think. Uh, it looks like it. Yeah, just I know we're kind of jumping ahead to the actions, but it doesn't like was included in the actions, but I will add it. And obviously, um, Jerry's not here this evening, so obviously, I'll chase that action up with him. Mm. And um, 
the top of page 18, a street populist coordinator. Yeah. Is that a typo? What should that have been, actually, do you think? Mm. That may well be a typo. Yeah, look as well. mm. Okay. Um, and perhaps, again, you'll need to liaise with Jerry, I guess, to find out what the correct terminology is there. To um, yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, to be honest, my guess is that it's a street population coordinator, but I don't know. Um, good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so there's those two matters for accuracy. Now, if we can go through the various different action points, that would be useful. Um, no, sorry, Chair, I think the first few are kind of for me. Um, yes. yes. Um, so hopefully everybody's seen the green flag. I'm not sure if I've accurately described it, the green flag work update that was sent around on, on the 16th of August. Thank you, Chair. Um, and Chief Executive Pay reports. I mean, some of these actions were prior to my time taking over, so I'm, I'm just trying to understand we, the history. Just, but yeah, I was going to say, just before we skip over this, um, it just again, um, since it was an update on the green flag work and carbon monitoring um, that has already been circulated to the committee. Um, but does anybody, I do have them in front of me, if you want me to just run through them so you can hear what those updates are. Do you want me to read through them quickly? Or is everybody satisfied? I think just from the point of view of the public, it's good practice, isn't it? To, to, uh... So with regard to the green flags, uh, the response that we got was that the Leisure Parks and Green Spaces Service develops, manages and maintains through an in-house team, 58 parks and green spaces across the borough, totaling some 282 hectares, ranging from major parks and green spaces, such as Hackney Marshes, London Fields and Clissold Park, to small gardens, such as Hoxton Square and Church Street Gardens. In 2023, 29 of the sites were recognised with Green Flag Awards, the quality standard for parks, already one of the highest totals in London. However, the Council is working towards securing 32 Green Flag Awards by 2026. And I believe that this all comes about because one councillor said, why can't all of our green spaces be going for green flag awards? And the answer came in the last paragraph, which says that while all of the council's 58 parks and green spaces are maintained to the same standard, not all would be suitable for a green flag award, given the type of green spaces that they are. In addition, a significant amount of additional work would be required to increase the number of applications for green flags beyond current levels. This is beyond existing staff resources. So in, an, in a nutshell, the answer is that we can't have all of our spaces as green flags. Some are not appropriate for that particular award. And at the moment, we don't have the resources to be able to put in the applications for all of them. Good. OK. And the other issue was with regard to um, CO monitoring. And the response that we got from Rob Miller was, we don't currently have routine CO monitoring. We have had the HSC airflow checked by external experts, which has confirmed that airflows are well within the parameters required if the building is fully occupied, noting that we are typically at circa 40 to 50 percent capacity so there is a lot of headroom there during the earlier stages of opening up as the lockdown restrictions eased we carried out additional co checks and these confirmed that the levels were well within the required limits so that would appear to show that we're on track as far as all of that's concerned good sorry gareth um, let's yeah um and just going back to the first sort of set of actions for me uh, chief executive pay report again it was before my time, but I am looking into that and hopefully have an update with you shortly. Um, I believe at the last meeting, the equalities demographic data, I think, was covered by Jerry, but I can certainly... It was, I think. Yeah, yeah. okay. And the last part, which I kind of ran into a bit of a dead end, was higher bikes. Um, again, it sounds like an issue before my time. If anybody could elaborate so I can just sort of hone down who I've just, is it higher bikes obscuring the pavement? Is that if I, if I understood that correctly? So I'm basically, is it our policy or, or if somebody could elaborate so I know what I'm kind of, who I'm going to and 
what I'm asking. So this is a problem which is, it's an action which we've inherited from the previous committee. Yeah. And um, Gareth wasn't the officer on the previous committee and I wasn't a member of the previous committee. So, so we actually just don't know what that action was with regard to higher bikes. Yeah. If anybody could elaborate. I mean, I was gonna presume it might be something to do with public realm, would that be correct? Oh, yep. Councillor um, Benio Lubbock. I think we had discussion around um, obstruction of, uh, of the pavements with the higher bikes, and maybe it was to talk about the um, uh, the, the rollout of more uh, docks and bays for higher bikes to be stored in, um, but also just sort of a general report, I think, around um, uh, fines that are issued and, and things like that. I mean, I have asked questions about that at full council, but um, it might be worth a bit more of a follow up and just seeing how that program's rolling out and the, the usage levels, etc. Okay. Councillor Ray, so are you thinking or have you got your hand up? <laughs> Both. Okay, thanks. Um, I think I've got one more for me. Yes, uh, one more. Sorry, I'm hogging, I'm hogging the actions a little bit. Uh, finally, uh, the other big one for me was to do with arranging a call with the committee members. I have been in discussions with Rob Miller. I believe some of the members have already gone to the Hackney Service Centre. Um, I think for me, going forward, is to sort of identify what those buildings would entail regarding an off-campus call um, and sort of Rob Miller would probably be my first port of call, and then identifying who would be the contact at that relevant building, and then perhaps identifying a date, and then putting that date out to the committee and, and saying, you know, can you visit on that day? Would that be, uh, I think first port of call is identifying buildings. To visit. I think we do need to identify exactly okay. how many buildings they are, there are, where they are, and therefore if we can group visits to, in a sensible way. Okay. Um, it seemed to be the best way forward to me. Okay. Um, but equally, we need to make sure that we're not springing ourselves on people. Yeah. Um, so they need to, you know, have suitable notification. Yeah. Come. Oh, sorry. Um, is, is this an ongoing series of tours? Because I think that already happened. Because I think this stemmed from the, there was a tour of the service centre. I mean, I understood it came off that tour. And I think at the last meeting it was envisioned that we've done the Hackney Service Centre. Oh, yeah, so it's an yeah. ongoing thing. So it's right, okay. Off campus, but obviously, I need to. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it sprang out of the Hackney Service Centre call. Um, and it's now just for me, first port of call is Rob Miller and identifying the buildings. Okay. Uh, and what those, um, and some dates that uh, the members could go and visit. Great. All right. Uh, Councillor Rete. Thank you, Chair. Um, with regards to number eight, which is um, the feedback on the number of service requests received in relation to food poisoning by members of the public and others, um, and considering the fact that Jerry is not here at the moment, I was just wondering, maybe at the next meeting, if we could have a summary of, of this in the report, I think that would be much better for us. I think Thanks. it's fair to say that we were anticipating that Jerry was going to be here this evening. So there are a number of updates that he was going to give us on things which um, we unfortunately can't get this evening because we were assuming he would be here to give us those. Um, yep, yeah, and Chair, and obviously in his absence, I will take the list of actions away and uh, consult with him, see if he has some updates. And the organogram could be part of the... That will, yep, <laughs> that will be part of that, yeah. Thank you. Um, Councillor Desmond, was there something you wanted to say? Yeah, I think uh, visiting these buildings in the general uh, Hackney area that we use is very useful, but I'd like some empirical statistics about the usage so that we know what we're seeing in terms of the numbers of people working there, if they're in five hour, and how much space each has, because a lot of people have course, been working at home, and things have been changing over the last three or four years. So I'd like to have some idea uh, and analysis, um, which is probably readily available prior to us going, so we know what we're looking for and what we're looking at. And also, it'd be useful to know if we're the freeholder, if we're the leaseholder, uh, the context of our 
involvement so that we can see if our um, use of the building is cost effective. That's a good thought, I think. Um, um, so, a bit of stats analysis, occupancy, uh, usage, um, status regarding freeholder, leaseholder, etc. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, could I just say that, you know, we don't have to wait for the next meeting to approve the uh, timetable for that. Uh, it does seem to me that if we manage to, we, we may well manage to get at least one visit in between now and the next meeting. So. Um, um, Yes, Chair, I will consult with Rob and see what we can do, but obviously we need to sort of identify how many buildings we're looking at, uh, maybe several. Um, so once I've done that, obviously some sort of stats analysis as well. So uh, I will consult with Rob and see what we can do. Good. Thank you. Okay. Um, in that case, I think we've covered everything from the minutes and the matters arising from the minutes, if that's... Uh, I believe so, Chair, and you said, uh, just for public record, I'll chase up those actions uh, related to officers who aren't present this evening. Good. Thank you very much. Okay, so at that point then, we're moving on to item five on the agenda, um, which is down as HR policy review. But I'm also told that um, this is linking in with item six as well. So perhaps I could ask the Sandra, um, if you would mind um, explaining for us, perhaps, and, and uh, introducing it, whatever you'd like to put before us. Of course. So, um, attached uh, for today is the uh, proposal for the paid domestic abuse leave policy uh, and the recommendations. I'll do some background on that shortly, uh, just to give you an update of what the paper actually contains and what we're asking for your approval I'll make that recommendation but also it's a recognition that actually there's there's this review of the policy which impacts on other policies across the council that relate to people so there is a, a plan to look at an overall kind of the policies that need to be reviewed now looking at things like the strategic plan our equality plan our commitments to uh, you know anti-racism and making sure that we are having those changes in a bit more of a structured way going forward. So my intention was to keep this update to give you a little bit of an overview about what we intend to do at the next meeting and then at that meeting bring you a, an overview of the plan over the period of time which of the HR workforce policies are going to take the priority because we need to make sure these things are feeded in and therefore be able to somewhat give a view of the journey, if you like, in terms of policy review over the next 12 months or so. So that was that part of the kind of update, which was the combining the policy piece. However, just to talk you through the paid domestic abuse leave policy. So by way of... Sorry, just before you go on to that, oh, does sorry. anybody have any questions about what uh, Sandra's just said with regard to the ongoing work? Councillor Webb. Thank you, Chair. I was saying that that item is going to be on our agenda every every meeting, and so you know, as is part of this program, um, then it would be good just to um, list out perhaps how you know which bits you're going to pick out when. That would feed into questions. Um, so yeah, so we can kind of see how how you're tackling it as you know. As, I don't think it goes organically, but just to uh, I just want to so if we know that so if we've got HR review as a standing item, but perhaps with some a couple of subheadings for each, so that we can see how it so that we see goes. how it goes. The other thing I was going to ask is so, so essentially we're going to be looking at it in bite-sized chunks, really, aren't we? Which is good, absolutely. Um, and and just as we have with the domestic abuse paid leave paper, uh, will we be expecting short papers on each of these things each time or? So yeah, the, it's important that, that where where committee um, needs to sign that off, that you have a very sort of similar brief as to what the changes are, what the proposals are, and what those recommendations are to be considered. And, you know, it's a recommendation, it would be for me. Uh, the decision is, is for the committee to make if you want to approve that or not or on occasion there may be further questions etc but in general you know the, the there should be there will be a paper 
on each of those subjects where we've made any changes to policy, your endorsement is needed in order for that to become part of the council's policies and individual workforce terms and conditions. Good. Thank you very much. That's clear. Um, in that case, let's officially then move on to item six, if we may. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. So this is the, uh, the the recommendation for the paid domestic use leave policy, just to cover. It is in the background papers, but just to cover the uh, definitions, it is that for people um, at the age of 50, 16 or over who are personally connected to each other, and secondly, the behaviour is abusive. So the terminology abusive covers physical or sexual abuse, it covers um, violent or threatening behaviour, controlling or coercive behaviour, economic abuse, uh, psychological, emotional or other abuse. And just to give a view in terms of how widespread it is, there is an estimated one in four women and one in six to seven men uh, will experience domestic abuse in their lifetime. Uh, it is, women are more likely than men to experience multiple instances of abuse, different types of uh, domestic abuse, um, including, you know, partner violence, sexual assault and stalking, and in particular sexual violence. Um, and as we know, the, you know, domestic abuse kills, on average, two women a week are killed by a current or former partner uh, in refuge but not to miss the point that men also experience this too. Uh, in terms of the review, it has been undertaken uh, jointly with Hackney's Domestic Abuse Intervention Services. Uh, it's important that it has included as well, you know, our, our workforce staff, uh, trade union colleagues to actually explore what is, you know, uh, an appropriate level of support from the council as a whole to individuals who ha are, or if, if we find that they are experiencing domestic abuse, how could we help support them best? So we recognise that the, uh, the council, Hackney, as an employer, plays a powerful role in tackling that domestic abuse. So we want to make sure that the support that we're giving, uh, it not only raises awareness, but we tackle the cultural barriers that exist around disclosure as well. So um, we know that at some point or at the point at which, you know, somebody leaves an abusive relationship, it's likely to be the time they're most vulnerable and that making arrangements for independent life and or for keeping themselves with the safe is going to be really impactful. We play a very important role in doing that. So what we've done is through consultation, there are some um, recommendations that have been made to a uh, corporate committee today to increase the current level of, um, of, of days for from five to 20 days for employees who have not just themselves but have dependents also so that would be paid leave uh, and to increase up to 10 days for from five to 10 for those who of those of our employees who don't have dependents and it's just a matter of sometimes there's just that extra bit of flexibility that's needed around it's not just children sometimes there is older people to care for and sometimes that can be a little bit complex so my recommendation to committees today is to approve uh, this increase i think it's we've had several conversations we've talk to trade unions, we've done this jointly and made sure that we've taken into account the real impact of um, you know, domestic abuse from, from people and they are also our employees. So should that occur, we have a supportive policy in place to help to support them. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we're lucky enough to have Councillor Williams here, who's obviously the cabinet member with responsibility for HR matters. I wonder if you'd like to add anything to that, Councillor Williams. I would, I would thank you very, very much, Chair, for allowing me to speak. Um, and I, I think it's really important that I thank all of the people who have been involved in um, developing the policy, updating the policy and bringing the update here tonight. Um, want to thank 
the trade unions as well, they have been instrumental in raising this with the council as the employer um, and stressing the importance for their members, but also all of our staff across the council. I think it's really important that we thank the domestic abuse intervention service as well. Um, early last year, um, on International Women's Day, we held an, an online event with staff talking about the impact of domestic abuse on staff, on their families, um, and, and heard of the very real um, impact for one of our former staff members. Um, I'm not going to go into to detail about that here, not least because this meeting is recorded, um, but, but I, I do want to stress that all of our teams um, and all of the trade unions are very invested in ensuring that we have the best possible support um, for, for our staff who are experiencing uh, domestic abuse. I also do want to thank uh, Meryl and Sandra as well. Um, Meryl, I'm sure you'll see on a regular basis, um, as she does a lot of the legwork on, on updating our, our HR policies, and also to Sandra um, for bringing a, a fresh air uh, to the council on our approach to working with the trade unions, ensuring that their input um, is, is recorded, um, accepted, and that we are working with them collegiately, um, and that their concerns are taken on board very seriously, and that we get to a point um, where we can see the fruit of their work here in the council chamber. Thank you very much. And just before I open it up to questions from, from members of the committee, I just wanted to be absolutely categorically clear about something. Um, whilst I think it's great that this work has come apart, partly because of the work that the council is doing to protect um, women and girls from violence, um, I just want to be clear that this leave policy also applies to men as well, doesn't it? So if men are victims of domestic violence, they have exactly the same rights. And for, for all um, em employees of the council chair. Thank you. It's yeah. the entitlement is exactly the same. Good. I've got a couple of other questions that I'd like to put, but, but I think it's fair to let other people go first. So Councillor Race. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Williams and officers as well. I think this is a really, um, really positive improvement to the policy. So thank you uh, very much for bringing it out. I very much welcome it. Um, I just wanted to ask about how um, you envisage this being communicated out, not just to people who might want to access um, the support, but also um, to make sure that the culture within the um, council, in particular for sort of line managers that might want to, might be able to sort of signpost um, uh, their colleagues to this, that they know it, that it exists. That it's a policy and that it's, um, it's, it's everyone is very welcome to access it um, if they so need. So just about that communication, the culture aspects of it would be great. Thank you. Absolutely. So thank you for the question. I think in terms of the plans for the communication, we couldn't, we, we've got plans that I can share with you now. It does need to be signed off and approved by the committee before we can do that. But we do have some internal comms that have been prepared which is actually looking at the, the revised version of the policy. There's also um, you know, some mess key messaging around domestic abuse in the workplace, uh, a guidance for managers, guidance for employees. Um, and also, once we've got all of that, the chief executive's emails, that will be one of the uh, avenues to kind of share the new approach. What does it mean? There's newsletters. Um, certainly in terms of embedding, uh, it's important that these are not just one-off messages because there will be some implications and impacts on some of the other areas of policies. There'll be further opportunity to reinforce these messages about those what we have available as support. We also have things like our employee assistance program. We want to make sure that that actually includes signposting. Uh, any, any of our colleagues who are looking on those areas looking for support we can do that uh, and, and equally it is really about um you know the continuous message rather than it being a one-off i think we've got a launching plan in terms of communication but it's certainly not the only opportunity that we will have or want to create to have to have those conversations 
Can I just ask one follow, very quick follow? Um, and I just wanted to, um, ob obviously, I'm sure this is part of it, but just to remember um, those colleagues that are not necessarily networked or that don't necessarily work in front of um, laptops or screens all day in the parks team, in the Meals on Wheels team, and things like that. Um, so colleagues across the across the network who don't necessarily get those, but I'm sure that's some covered as well. Can I just chat with you because I can somewhat not hear, I can hear some of that, but I think. Yeah, so I was just going to say, would everybody mind speaking up a bit? Because the talking, rain is. <laughs> sorry, Councillor. Are we talking about more broadly? Because obviously we have uh, the sort of like the frontline staff that may not necessarily have that direct connection with our chief executives. So totally um, have that in mind in terms of how do we make sure that our messaging goes out. So what we have is we have things called the change champions. You know, we have we have got our staff networks and our staff network groups. Uh, you know, since joining the council, one of our aims is to bring those voices together and equally have different forms of communication that actually reach out uh, much more widely than potentially we have done so far. So I think that in relation to embedding, the point is is very well sort of at the forefront of, of the mind of myself and colleagues. Councillor Sisarongi. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to look at page 27, the business case, um, paragraph four. I'd like to commend um, the report authors in respect of the proposed change will also help the council evidence its commitment to safeguarding children. I think that is really commendable and I just want that to be highlighted. And, and my question is, um, on page 28, the, although the onus is on the perpetrator, um, the approach to perpetrators is a key area of expansion. Is it possible to um, expand a little bit on that at this juncture? Thank you. So in terms to the, uh, the approach of the perpetrators, to some degree that's not something that kind of falls directly in line with what we do as a, as a policy because we're not necessarily, uh, the policy is about supporting individuals to actually have a safe place and making sure that there is um, you know, sufficient support for them. In terms of the perpetrators, I think that's a bit of a combination of, of what needs to happen and how to tackle that best. So where, where we would be focused on is providing our support and being part of those discussions, uh, keep continuously looking and reflecting on does our policy help continue to help our employees? As I was saying before, I don't think this is a one-off approach. I don't think this is just signed up to and you know, that's it. We, we know exactly how much leave that, we, that we're giving uh, to individuals. This is a bit more than that and it's about taking that next step to actually being part of the support of what it means to tackle the perpetrators but I don't think I could say in this meeting now you know what does that look like and how how is that to be established it's a bit of that recognition that this is a very key and important part of addressing this but equally there is potentially more that we need to make sure we continue to feed into so that we make the right changes in terms of that response going forward. Voice oh, is quite loud and the rain is quite soft. <laughs> yes, okay. Um, I apologise, my colleague has rightly told me off um, and, and I accept that. Um, I uh, appreciate the, the very holistic approach and I commend you on that, but also wanted to highlight the fact that you have really addressed the issue of safeguarding children as well. As um, So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure if it was Councillor Desmond who I saw earlier on, or and in that case it would be Councillor, Councillor Benny Lovett. Well, I was trying to get above the hub of the Heathrow Airport and suddenly moved to Hackney. Um, I, I do think this is a very useful paper and extremely helpful, um, not only of our casework, but I think it's self-evident that there's more and more domestic abuse, which is extremely distressing, and it's not always something the police are able or willing or have the resources to effectively deal with. And I'm particularly pleased that you include stalking here because it is a severe problem and I've certainly had to deal with instances where there have been estranged partners who've become obsessive 
And to be honest, you need a degree in psychology to know whether it will turn out terribly or whether it can be dealt with through counselling or discussion. But I think that it's right and proper that our staff should be given an opportunity to have time off to do as they see fit to try and ameliorate the situation because unfortunately this problem doesn't seem to be diminishing. So well done on this. I think it's very, very sensible. Thank you, Councillor Desmond. Councillor Benny Lover? Yeah, thank you. I'd, I'd echo uh, Councillor Desmond's uh, statement. I was very pleased to, to read this paper. Um, I just had a couple of quick questions. You mentioned about um, sort of cultural considerations. I'm wondering if that's talking about sort of the corporate culture, or was there also considerations around people's cultural backgrounds and how that's communicated, or uh, is there anything particular? Because I, I hadn't noticed something about that in the paper I might have missed, um, or maybe it's, it's sort of extra to this. Um, and the other thing was around um, other organisations and contractors um, or schools outside of Hackney. Obviously, we don't have control over that, but maybe it's something that we can do in terms of promoting, um, especially to our contractors, because otherwise we sort of have a bit of a two-tier kind of system, and I wonder if that's, that's part of the plans going forward. So, in terms of the, uh, the word culture, I think it's in its entirety. So, there could be cultures that are within, um, you know, communities, but it's also actually it's about the culture within the organisation too. I think whilst we're not certainly not advocate, advocating there's any normalisation of anything to do with domestic abuse, I think the how to and how to get help uh, it is something we need to keep championing to make sure that our colleagues feel more comfortable to reach out um, and not be isolated and not to feel as though actually is this still we can have 20 days but ultimately we need people to feel as though they can reach out to us uh, if they are experiencing these things and making sure that that keeps being championed so there may well be um, its culture in its entirety it would be it would be the view um, and the second question uh, about promoting to um, uh, contractors or other Absolutely. areas. So I think in terms of the messaging um, that that you know committee endorsing this allows us to do is to make it very um, prominent and external, not just from within our contract, but actually a very strong message of Hackney that this is this is where we, we don't allow uh, domestic abuse. We don't support that, and we actually able to really turn around turn that around into a very strong commitment by the way that we actually share those communications outwardly share it with our contracts and partners about what those expectations are um, and also uh, encourage colleagues not just internally but, at, but externally to actually consider Hackney as one of those places where there is no tolerance for this. Could I ask if we'd be willing to think about going further with contractors to find out whether or not suitable contractors should have at least at the very least a domestic violence policy before we think about engaging them so it's potentially possible i don't have the answer right now for for committee but it's possible that that's already one of the checks that have been made in terms of procurement and contracting i certainly can check and bring back to committee an overview of actually do we do that now it could be one of the requirements i'm just not 100 percent certain to answer that today but i certainly think that it's something that we can ask and even if it's not there we could explore about making that a requirement that they must themselves have a domestic violence policy thank you um councillor thank you chair and i'd like to say a big thank you for and um, bring them um, for the report which i really applaud um i think it's really good to see how the importance that we've actually put to this with regard to our officers and you've actually answered my question um which is with regards to contractors and um you've answered it and i really look forward to possibly having that response and also um in addition to that where such policy or where they do not have anything in place, it might be good to look into training, you know, where they could put that in place, you know, to ensure that it goes alongside with what we have actually proposed. Thank you. Go ahead, please. 
So in response to that, um, Councillor Essie, yes, we can certainly have a requirement of those that we contract with to have a domestic abuse policy. And if not, to be fair, unless we're already in contract with them, then it should be a requirement at the point of when you're contracting. It's just potentially, now that we've got this change, should committee approve, then we have an opportunity to, to make that a little bit more uh, of a requirement of the contract going forward. Uh, but even if not, it can be, you know, could you look at some training to ensure that we are satisfied that the people who work for Hackney, in Hackney, within the community, equally hold this to the same level of uh, high regard, scrutiny and safety for those people who work uh, with us or for us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Narthos. Um, yeah, I just want to echo what a few of my colleagues have said about, you know, I think this is a really good good paper and, and a piece sort of good step forward we've made in expanding um, the support. I just had a couple of questions. One's quite a, a, a quick one of um, how does this level of um, of sort of leave uh, compared to sort of other organisations? Have you sort of benchmarked it as an approach? Obviously, it's an increase, but you know, what, what do sort of similar policies elsewhere look like? And I was just wondering as well, in terms of, you know, you touched a bit on the other support that's available and just whether there's any consideration of sort of more formally tying in some of that other support, whether that's more proactive, reaching out from support services to, to people who sort of take this leave or whether there's something around ensuring managers, if they do grant, um, you know, sort of employees uh, sort of this leave, whether there's some more they can do to make sure they're offering support to those people. Uh, thank you. So in terms of the uh, comparison, I think we've had a, uh, it's a very similar now uh, to uh, schools and having education, you know, kind of giving around about the same sort of level, in fact, the same level of support and domestic leave. I think in terms of how do we compare uh, with, with other councils, I think there's, a, there's always going to be a discretionary element of this so you know managers despite the fact that you know you may have five days you've always been able to as managers use some discussion based on an individual circumstance and um, i think what this does is raise the level of where you need to then start thinking about actually individually as a as a um you know as a manager what should we be looking to do to help and support that and obviously, we have ourselves as uh, you know HR colleagues that can help in that deliberation. So I do think, in terms of levels, the pre-approved part has increased, and we're probably more significant than than most in relation to the twenty days, at least with with dependents. But ultimately, if you were asked to compare, you know, there, there will always be those discretions. So it can sometimes seem. Uh, sorry, Councillor Williams, you wanted to add, but it's fine. So it can. What I'm saying is, it's a, it's a very good, strong uh, level of commitment without having to, um, I guess, to best support an individual at the time when they really need it, and they don't have to get you know get into very big debates with managers about you know how many days and all of that sort of thing. We want to make sure our colleagues feel really supportive about. Let, let's get you some help and support as quickly as we can and for, for as long as is needed. Councillor Williams. Hopefully this is a helpful contribution. Um, both officers and lead members have a forum through London councils. Um, so in terms of benchmarking with other London councils, uh, so, yeah, with other authorities in London, um, London councils are in a position to do that better than we might be as an individual council. Um, and they can look at it on all sorts of criteria. Um, and, and they do this for, for, for a number of policy policy areas. And the, the benefit of doing it like that is that it pulls up the level right across London. Um, so that's something that I can take back to the HR forum at London Councils and can leave with uh, Sandra to, to do the same with um, the HR officers. Thank you, Councillor William. Um, perhaps I can just ask my question now, which is on a similar sort of theme, which is that it does occur to me that um, 
given the kinds of reasons that people are going to need to take this leave, um, which is often around solicitor's appointments and stuff like that, um, it does seem to me that quite often they won't need a full day, but that actually to be able to take a half day or even sometimes just a couple of hours rather than to take a full day would be useful to them. So have we sort of built into this policy some way for them to be able to do that? Um, and I suppose I just want to echo my colleagues' feeling that this is, in, uh, I think, an important policy. I think it's really um, empowering for people who are quite often at their lowest ebb during these times. Um, at the moment, the cost case makes it look like it's not going to cost very much. If it does end up costing us more, I think that's probably a good thing because it's about transparency and these things coming out into the open. And I think it's particularly important that members of staff shouldn't have to be sort of sneaking around trying to sneak time off um, without getting the support from their managers in order to fulfill those sorts of engagements that they need to sometimes. So I see this as a, a really positive thing. Um, thank you. But if you could just come back about the hours or half days or whatever, that would be useful. So certainly um, there, there was five days before in this policy. Um, it's never been essential that you have to take it in that year. But here's a day here and a day there. This expands that, that remit. So it, it's not any specific, you know, a half day or a day and things like that. The whole point of this is to have a very uh, human and supportive um, approach to what people need. So I think in part of it, one of the important things is about the messaging and the embedding that we talked about earlier on that makes that really clear for managers. You know, this isn't just a case of, you know, can we look in the policy and you've, you know, you've got five days now or you've got 20 days now. It has to be much more of a supportive approach for us to actually get down to the, in reality tackling it. So it doesn't just sit as something that's on a shelf and it kind of just it works or it doesn't work we really want that to be very direct in terms of that support and your your other question uh, chair was the question really was about how it can be taken i think you've answered that really there's flexibility there um i suppose there is a question which occurs to me which is that you know if somebody needs to take that full amount of time and perhaps takes it over potentially over 40 days rather than 20 but half yeah. a day at a time um it does seem to me that there could be some issues around confidentiality with colleagues and what have you, and and you know what, how would how would managers be expected to deal with that? So I think there's 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 a lot to do with you know going back to what we were talking about. There's a, there's a part of this is about the comms. There's the other part of it that's about support to managers to help them to have the discussions about how do we deal with this really? How what what is the impact on us in in terms of feeling confident and comfortable in having those in having those conversations and supportive. I do remember what the thing was, Chair. You talked about the potential for there to be an increase, if you like, um, because the the cost of this at the moment is quite low. I would say, from a very sort of HR professional perspective, is that sometimes we don't know where that cost really is. So sometimes that cost is, can be in sickness absence, for example. Um, and it doesn't show up in the same way. So I think, you know, the more that we can do to be as supportive proactively with our colleagues, particularly in times of need, we may see um, an increase there, but we could see significant increases, el decreases elsewhere. Very hard to track some of those trends when they don't um, outwardly appear to be related, but can be, uh, because this is something that's potentially kept a little quieter than we than we even we want. So we want to try and make sure that we get more of the real statistics if there's anything that's hidden and we're able to not just ask for the numbers but have a response to that when we hear those things. So I think this is a, a, a bit of a start of a journey should the committee approve. Thank you very much. Councillor Webb. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question is about training around it. Um, violence of this nature is not necessarily out in the open, and it's and it can be really <laughs> sneaky. Um, and it's awareness for everybody 
because everybody might not understand that when you get a call in and they're asking about their partners whether they're in the workplace what time you know and all this kind of stuff and it may be very innocent but um having gone on some awareness training you suddenly realize that what we talk if we answer the phone and we're giving out information about other people um that's so important and it's that subtlety that people may not realize and so backing this up if we can really put that message out which people may think is unnecessary until they understand the importance that i'm saying that john hasn't come into work and that person thinks they've gone to work because they're dealing with major issues that we don't know about it's that training so it's just that ask it really only needs to be you know bite sites but having that awareness just changes your outlook and if there's an instruction to to all our employees think about what information you're giving up because you just never know what the reason is behind so it's just that ask thank you Jim. thank you councillor i think that speaks for itself dude <laughs> thank you Okay, um, I don't think anybody else needs to say anything unless they're desperate to. And um, can I ask whether or not we can approve this report, please? Agreed. Thank you. In that case, um, if you're wanting to get home, <laughs> free to go if you'd like to. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we move on to to look at the draft work program briefly now. Chair, I, I know we've got item seven, Sandra, I think you just wanted to clarify regarding that item seven that was on the agenda. Just item sorry, seven. Sir, item seven, obviously it's on the agenda, you just wanted to clarify. Oh, sorry, there yep, a, yep. there's a point of clarification for item seven. So oh, it okay. is a general sort of HR uh, update brief. It's actually not for corporate committees, for CJC. So it's actually been put onto the wrong um uh, committee meeting so my apologies it's not that i wouldn't uh, update the corporate committee but the content probably wouldn't be appropriate for here so that's my 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 error and apologies for that uh members thank, thank, thank you, you sandra for clarifying thank you good okay so um as far as the draft work program is concerned um obviously we've got a pretty um short meeting this evening um pretty light agenda um i think that's likely to mean that we're going to have a heavier agenda in december i'm afraid so um stand by for that everybody um does anybody have any comments or observations to make about the work program council young um so just to check on the draft work program it says for today um forgive me because i was late so you might have dealt with this before i came in um draft work program says update on the public realm and policies for tables and chairs on pavements and regulatory services services service plan update whatever that is uh, have you already dealt with that the fact that we're not doing those today and therefore presumably we will do them on another date i think the um the public realm has been pushed to june no into march sorry um so um, Yes, Chair, I mean, obviously prior to publication of the papers, uh, we have the work programme and notify the relevant officers that that is down on the work programme for this meeting. And then obviously the officers notify me whether, yes, it's coming or no, it isn't. And obviously in the case of the, well, obviously all three items, well, I know we've kind of covered HR policy, but obviously the two items, public realm and the regulatory services service plan update, I was notified by the relevant officers they were not coming to these meetings so obviously i'll just say on the work plan that's where they're staying um but no update this evening so public realm i can see comes up later mm -hmm. what about regulate is that really what it's called regulatory services service plan um is that coming up later as well if i just missed it um, in fairness i think we were under the impression that that, that might have um that Jerry was going to be here this evening, weren't we? Yeah, Chair. Uh, and obviously, neither public realm or that regulatory services service plan update on the agenda for this evening. Um, so I can only deduce that they will go forward now and be added to the work program for December. 
that would appear to be the most the public realm as well i think logical conclusion if there's no update here and then i can certainly check with the officers and i i know regarding the public realm i was informed that i think there is some sort of update that is coming i think uh, you've got public prior to the december March. meeting i think you've got public realm in march right 13th of we've March. we've put it down as yeah. march at the moment yes yeah yeah i'm just yes aware that the regulatory services are quite important cover quite a broad mm -hmm. area mm. okay we do want to know what they're doing um in my sort of action list from the last meeting obviously there's now another action for me to sort of chase that up and find out what the status is and what's happening thank you councillor benini lovett yeah um yeah i was a bit concerned saying pushing things into the december uh, work plan just because the strategic plan update i imagine is going to be quite a big piece because that's a quite a large document um in addition it would be great if we could have some advanced sight of of that you know before um the papers come out because i imagine that's going to be quite a chunky piece i don't know if that will be possible but that, that would be great um and um just on the march um item number three on the public spaces protection order i just want to check is there more than one public spaces protection order i know that there's one around alcohol um is there also one around dogs um and are, are they are those looked at separately um i know that there's a consultation out at the moment around uh, around um dogs um and then in addition um on our terms of reference it says that we approve uh, polling districts uh polling station reviews and i know we've had a little uh, session on that as members um and i'm wondering if that needs to go into a future work plan um if that's coming from electoral services it was that last bit about terms of reference policies okay, chair okay sorry. Uh, sorry the last part i said was around um the polling districts i know that's in our terms of reference that we have to approve changes to polling districts um uh polling stations that kind of thing and we've uh, as councillors been um asked to uh help support that work a little bit and i'm just wondering if that's going to have to come to us to just approve any changes to the polling stations um yeah i assume that'll be in advance of elections next year potentially Thank you for that. I think that's a good observation and um, one that we can check. It does seem like it would fall yeah. under our remit, definitely. Um, sorry. Apologies, I can answer the public space protection order question now if you want. There's two, alcohol one uh, and a dog one, so they're both separate. Uh, the dog one, there is a dog one currently in place and the one that is going to consultation was out to consultation is one because they last three years so it's one to either be amended or come after uh, can i just check then is the is the one that we've got scheduled for march is that the one around alcohol or the one around dogs and do we need to um review both of them do you know the answer to that hmm. i will double check for you jerry but i think the one that well, one that ends in March is one to do with dogs. I'll have to check the alcohol one. Thank you. Okay. And uh, the other thing, of course, um, that, oh, sorry, Councillor Desmond. Um, I, I, I mentioned the the, the um, because you also talked about the strategic review and that that would be a, a significant item on the agenda, which I'm sure it will be. Um, at the moment, you've had notice, I think, that uh, we've asked for a briefing from um, Sonia Khan about the strategic review. Um, I think part of that briefing will be to, to enable us to understand much better how the strategic review is structured and how we want to examine it and how we want it presented to us. Um, and as we've left it currently, um, it would probably come back to us twice. Um, that isn't on here at the moment because we're not sure about that until we've decided in that meeting in October. That is not a public meeting. It's a briefing rather than a public meeting. But it seems to me that we can decide how we want it to fit into our, into our work plan at that meeting, basically. Um, good. Okay. Um, Councillor Desmond. Uh, during the COVID crisis, the Homerton Hospital issued uh, various discs to uh, staff who had to go out and see patients who couldn't 
Otherwise, companies were dissed for their cars, so they could park during visiting uh, various patients. So this made sense and was fine. But a, a point arose where a member of staff may or may not have received one that had been photocopied, and unfortunately, there was severe enforcement taking place. So although I don't want it to be a main issue, what I'd like in the next six months as an inquiry to take place that we contact competency if any of these were photocopied and also perhaps liaise with enforcement because it's a very sad situation if someone who's working in the NHS and a lot of these um, discs ran out in July and the particular person who contacted me had enforcement measures taken well before that and possibly through no fault of her own she was penalized and it may have been that the hospital during the crisis just photocopied a few of these discs so i'd like some clarity perhaps by liaising with the hospital and our own enforcement team to see if some explanation of this can take place because i don't like to hear that nurses working in the nhs are penalized when they're coming about their their duties I'm not quite sure whether that falls within our remit as corporate committee or just uh, some casework really that you need to take up with the the parking people and I, I, I would double check in terms of reference but I'm going to be honest from my recollection I don't think it does fall under that it's probably more a query that you need to give to relevant officers if it's to do with parking you'd want to contact Kevin Keady <laughs> I mean, he may end up asking me something. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I feel probably if you don't have any joy, but I think you probably will because certainly when I've contacted him on similar sorts of issues, he's been very responsive. So, out to the web. Thank you, Chair. Um, quite a lot of the reports that come to us are annual reports, and I would think that there's limited space for moving them around. I mean, either we're reporting them or we're not, as in the departments. And when they're done, they should come to us if it's under our remit. But particularly the one on the food safety, I thought that was a statutory kind of, you know, it just has to be done. Doesn't that have a deadline? And and if it's done, then why haven't we got it? Mm -hmm. um, it's really the question. I mean, I, there seems like a quite a lot, I, some, I do get flexibility. But there's a lot that we know that we do the gender pay gap. We know that we do the statutory food safety. And there always just seems to be a bit of a swing and a sway. Mm -hmm. And it'd be just nice to know what they have to produce it by when. So we, we know that they should be. And, you know, I, I just don't understand why, if they have done the food safety uh, report, why we haven't got it tonight, even if Jerry can't do it. Jeff. Mm -hmm. um, well, what we can do is we can, um, I guess we can find out the deadlines by which these reports need to be done, which would be a useful thing for us to have knowledge of anyway, I think, wouldn't it? Um, and something like the public realm, which I, which has now been pushed at least twice. And, um, you know, I, I, I think perhaps what I need to do is to drop a note and say, why is this constantly being pushed forward? Because, you know, you can't push things into touch all the time, can you? So perhaps what we can try and do is to get um, a timetable of, of deadlines when these reports have got to be done. And that would help us to look at the work program too, because there is a danger, isn't there, if things keep getting pushed along, that you end up with one meeting where we've got you know, a load of different reports and not enough time to, to examine them. It's been nice this evening because we've had plenty of time to look at this report and to comment on it. It was very good. But if we were had if we had three others that we were trying to cram in as well, it would be difficult. So I think we should take that away and and uh, yeah, that. yes, Chair. I mean, obviously, the report authors have a deadline for papers for these meetings, which I make them aware of. Um, and obviously, if they haven't got a report for me, then. They haven't got a report from me, so but obviously there's a bit before that, which is sounds more like sort of internal deadlines. Yeah, well, I think we need I'm to know those sort of deadlines. Because... Yeah, I'm not privy to a deadline that one I'm sort of focuses on. Can you get this paper to my meeting? 
by this date so I can publish in time. Yeah, and obviously, but it would be useful for us to yeah. know, for example, if the deadline on this food one is the end of the year, mm -hmm. then uh, yeah. because there does come a point where if we haven't had it by the end of the year and we haven't been pushing for it, then it's us who are responsible for not, yes. Um, yes. not making sure that it's been approved properly. So we do need to know those things, I think. Okay. Good. Um, thank you very much. Um, at this point, then, I think we can move on to any other business. Um, I haven't been notified of anything. Um, we've talked about that briefing meeting on the 10th of October. I really hope that we can all get to that if possible, because I think it will be quite dense. Um, I've asked Sonia if she can provide some reading for us in advance, um, and I think she will try to do that, so that hopefully we can all come to that meeting um, fully informed. Uh, yes, Chair, and obviously the invitation has gone out. 10th of October, just across the way, 6.30. Uh, I believe there's also a link in that invitation. There is a link yep. to, to a summary version of the strategic plan, yep. but I think that she also wants to try and send us some sort of a briefing document in okay. advance too. So, okay. so if we could all do our best to, to read that if we can. Um, and also members to note that the next full meeting of corporate committee is on the 12th of December. So... Um, Good. And I'll, I'll note what you say about these reports slipping forward. It's not good practice, and I think we need to try and um, get on top of it. Could we just have another column down the side of the forward plan with that information with on it? With the dates of the deadline okay. dates. Tell well, me well, if that's going to be hugely difficult. Yep, I can certainly look into that. Good. Okay. Well, thanks very much, everybody, for coming. And I think we can now close the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mario.